Hello and welcome. I am Liz Coleman, a master's social work student and a graduate assistant here at the University at Buffalo in the School of Social Work. Thanks for joining us. Data from the Annie E. Casey Foundation's Kids Count Data Center showed that while Black children accounted for just under 14% of the total child population in 2018, they made up nearly 23% of the total number of children in the foster system. The racist history of child welfare and the ongoing racial disparities and outcomes for black and brown children make us as social workers complicit in the violence that children experience as part of that system. Today, we are joined by Dean Allen Detlaff to learn about racial justice in child welfare and the upend movement. Alan Detlaff is Dean of the Graduate College of, so of Social Work at the University of Houston and the inaugural Maconda Brown O'Connor Endowed Dean's Chair. Prior to entering academia, Dean Detlaff worked in the child welfare system as a caseworker and administrator, where he specialized in investigations of maltreatment. He received his bachelor's degree in social work from TCU and master's in social work and PhD from the University of Texas at Arlington. Dean Detlaff's research focuses on addressing and eliminating the impacts of structural and institutional racism on black children and families involved in the child welfare system. Dr. Annette's Annette Samanchin Jones is the PhD program director here at the UB School of Social Work. Dr. Samantha Jones's research focuses on innovative approaches in child welfare that aim to strengthen child well-being and permanency. Her research and teaching are informed by her professional experience working with children and families. She partners with public and private child welfare organizations on projects such as promoting relational permanence for youth in foster care, strengthening supportive networks for vulnerable youth, identifying supports for families and children who have experienced chronic neglect and building organizational capacity to implement evidence-based trauma treatments. Dean Detlaff and Dr. Samantha Jones, we are so excited to have you both with us here today. Thank you, Liz. It's an honor. It's an honor to be with you all. I've been looking forward to this presentation. I appreciate all of you for being here um, today. Um, you know, as as you heard in that introduction, I started my career um, as a social worker working for Child Protective Services. It's the reason that I got into social work. Um, you know, I was kind of an aimless junior college student for a time in my early twenties. Didn't really know what I wanted to wanted to do with my career. I knew I wanted to do something with children. I knew I wanted to do something that helped people, um, but I didn't know what that would look like. And one evening I saw a news story about um, where a reporter went on a ride along with a Child Protective Services caseworker. Um, and that story, that made me realize, wow, this is the work that I wanna do. I could really help um, children and families through this work. Um, and I worked in that system for many years. Um, and the entire time I worked in that system, I worked in the investigations field. So I removed children from their parents. That was my job. Um, and you know, now my work focuses on abolition of that system. Um, you know, that was a, a long journey. You know, that was 20 years ago that I worked in that system. But it really started from a place where after I left the system, realizing that the system never talks about the harm that it causes children when they when children are separated from their parents. The system doesn't talk about how traumatic foster care is for children. And when I was working in the system, it, the system didn't talk about how over the over removal and over surveillance of black and brown children. It wasn't until after I left the system that I realized that and I was able to kind of think back on my career and realize many of the children that I removed didn't need to be removed. There were other things that could have been done, but I was caught up in a culture of removal where that's just the response. That's just what you do um, when, when there's concerns in families. I never thought about how much children love their parents, how much those parents love their children, and how harmful it was for them to be separated. But what I realized after many years after I left the system, of the probably hundreds of children that I removed from their parents, not one child ever said 
thank you so much for removing me from my horrible abusive parents. All they wanted to know is when they could go back home. Um, realizing that, realizing that almost all of the children that I removed were black or brown children, really kind of changed the directory of my career and kind of informed the work that I do today to try to stop that harm from happening and to educate more people about the harms of that system. So um, I'll share with you today um, the, this work that we call the Up In Movement to abolish the child welfare system. And then, um, so I'll talk a little bit about that, how, why we think abolition is necessary. And then I know we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So I'll go ahead and share some slides now. So to start off as an overview, um, today I'll talk a little bit about what we know about racial disproportionality and disparities in the child welfare system, what we know about the harm that results to children from child welfare intervention, and specifically the disproportionate harm that results to Black children and Native children and families. And then I'll talk about the up in movement and why we believe that abolition is necessary to end that harm. Um, and so to kind of like start just with an kind of overview of what we're going to talk today about today, you know, racial disproportionality or the overrepresentation of children of color in the system is something that's been known in the child welfare system for over 50 years, um, but persists as a problem. This isn't a new problem. Um, the child welfare system has known that they over surveil, over remove black children for decades. Um, in recent years, I'd say probably the last like 10 or 15 years, there's been a lot of debates about what causes disproportionality. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that today. And, but the important thing related to that debate is that because there's this debate largely in academic circles, um, that's led to efforts to address disproportionality being stalled. Um, when I first started working, when I, after I left the system, went into a PhD program, um, I started working with the state of Texas on their efforts to reduce disproportionality around the mid 2000s. And at that time, there was a lot of attention around disproportionality, a lot of funding from private philanthropy was going to child welfare systems to try to address this problem of overrepresentation of black children. Um, in recent years, that's largely stopped. And in a lot of ways, it's because of this um, back and forth between academics, which then informs the field about how we approach this issue. So disproportionality is still a problem today. Um, and that disproportionate involvement of Black children in the system causes disproportionate harm. And the failure of the system to be able to effectively address that issue just perpetuates that harm. So given the continuation of harm to children by this system, um, many of us believe it's, a time, it's time to consider a new way of thinking about how we care about children and families. Um, so brief background about racial disproportionality. Um, as I said, this has been going on since the 1960s, at least the 1960s. Prior to that, um, going back to the origins of the child welfare system, Black children were intentionally excluded from child welfare services when the system started around the 1960s um, related to some policies um, related to welfare, aid for families with dependent children. Um, Black children started to become very overrepresented in the system. Um, today, as you heard in the introduction, Black children represent about a quarter of all children in foster care, although they represent only about 15% of children in the general population. Much of the discourse about disproportionality and re research about disproportionality has focused on Black children because they're the population that's been most significantly impacted by this problem. Uh, but disproportionality also um, impacts Native American and Latinx children, but to a slightly lesser degree and with a lot of variation by state. If you look at this chart here, you could see the population of Black children, the blue bar at the bottom, as I said, about 15% of the population, about 25% of children in care. When you look at white children who are the green bar in the middle, you see that those numbers go down. White children are about 52% of children in the population, um, but about 49% of children in care. Similar for Latinx children. Latinx children are about 25% of the population, but only a little over 22% of children in foster care. So Latinx children are actually underrepresented in the child welfare system when you look at the national level. If you were to look at the state level, you'd see that Latinx children are overrepresented in about 20 states, 
um, right now, which is an increase from about 10 states back in 2010. So we see disproportionality rates rising for Latinx children. At the very top, that very small light blue bar is um, Native American children. You'll see that they represent only 1% of the population, but actually represent 2.6% of children in foster care. So Native American children are represented in foster care at a rate more than double their proportion of the population. But again, there's a lot of statewide variation where there's a large overrepresentation in some states. In Minnesota, Native American children are overrepresented at a rate of 15 times their proportion in the general population. And then in some states like Texas, there's hardly any presence of Native American children in the system at all. Um, and then racial disproportionality, that overrepresentation of children in foster care, exists because of disparities that occur in entries into the system and exits from the system. And what we know is that starting with that initial hotline call, black children are more likely than white children to be reported for maltreatment, confirmed or substantiated for maltreatment, and removed from their homes and placed in foster care than white children. Then once in foster care, black children are less likely than other children to exit to reunification, and they spend longer time in foster care. So it's these disparities in the entries to foster care and the exits from foster care that create racial disproportionality. So in terms of why disproportionality exists, um, you know, this, as I said, you know, this first came to national attention with this um, seminal publication, Children of the Storm, Black Children in American Child Welfare in the early 1970s. And when this first came to national attention, this problem of overrepresentation, findings from the National Incident Studies of Child Abuse and Neglect were used to understand this as a problem resulting from racism or bias. Um, and essentially, this National Incident Studies is an attempt of, of the federal government to understand the prevalence of maltreatment in the United States. Um, and it's periodically done at different intervals, not, not any specific intervals, but you can see here, um, the NIST had been done in 1980, 1986, and 1993. And all of these studies of the NIST found that there were no differences in rates of maltreatment between Black children and children of other races. That led people to conclude, then that must mean there's a problem of racism or bias in the system. There's no difference in maltreatment rates, but we see this huge overrepresentation of Black children in the system. That changed in 2010 when the um, newest or most recent version of the National Incident Study was released in 2010 and found for the first time that rates of maltreatment for black children were higher than those for white or Latinx children. Um, and the researchers explained that those differences were detected because largely because of an increased gap in income between black and white families since the prior national incident studies. And what we saw in the NIST is this really big correlation between poverty and maltreatment that showed that children in low socioeconomic status households experience maltreatment at a rate more than five times the rate of other children. And black families are more than twice as likely to, as white families to live in poverty. So we saw a lot of research being done around this time about the relationship between poverty and maltreatment and how much that contributed to racial disproportionality. What happened, though, is this kind of history of research findings about that led to this debate, which, which still exists in the field today, where there's a debate between what some scholars call disproportionate need, meaning the greater likelihood of Black families to experience poverty and the risk factors related to that, and the racial bias that exists within child welfare systems. There's a lot of research about both of these issues, disproportionate need and racial bias in the system. And we know from the research that both of those things are true. As I said, Black families are more likely to live in poverty, and poverty is a significant predictor of maltreatment. Um, but there's also a lot of research that shows that racial bias exists in the system. What has happened, though, is that those scholars that really purport that this disproportionate need is the stronger driver of disproportionality largely discount racism in the system and will say that racism is not a problem in the system. Um, Today, there are child welfare scholars who will tell you racism is not a problem in the child welfare system, that the only cause of disproportionality is poverty, despite all of the research showing racial bias. So there are agendas that are trying to be forwarded in this work. Um, the harm of that 
is that because of this debate, because practitioners, policymakers listen to the scholars that do this work, it's resulted in confusion in the field. Um, if people believe that disproportionality happens because of things outside the system, because of poverty, other social factors, then they don't think there's a problem and they don't do anything to address that. And these other scholars have been actively critical of efforts to do things like anti-racism training, cultural responsiveness training, and we'll just say that that's not effective. Child welfare systems don't need to be doing that. So the result then has been that these efforts to try to address disproportionality have largely stalled. And what we've known to be a problem for decades persists in the child welfare system. But really, when we look at the broad body of literature about why racial disproportionality exists, we see that it's much more complex than just this bias versus need argument. Um, we see that um, most of the literature can be broken down into kind of four big theories. One, disproportionate need. As I said, you know, poverty and related risk factors um, do contribute to involvement in child welfare systems. We also know from the research that racial bias among child welfare staff and racial bias among mandated reporters has been very well documented, um, as well as institutional racism in the policies and practices of child welfare systems. Um, disproportionality also results from some system factors, things like a lack of resources to address the unique needs of families of color. This also relates to turnover, um, training issues, just the fact that the child welfare workforce is a very, because of turnover, uh, an untrained, constantly kind of churning workforce. And then things related to geographic con context, um, neighborhood conditions of concentrated poverty, um, Black families because of things like redlining and the history of um, policies in the United States that contribute to more Black families living in communities with concentrated poverty than may contribute to involvement in the child welfare system. What tends to get lost in these arguments, though, even these arguments about disproportionate need versus bias, is that all of these factors, and in particular disproportionate need, result from common underlying factors of structural and institutional racism, both within the system and outside of the system. So regardless of which theory of disproportionality you're talking about, it all boils down to racism. There's racism in society that contributes to disproportionality, and there's racism in the system that contributes to disproportionality. Um, we could look at it this way, and this is a great chart that my colleague Rico Boyd um, developed for a paper that we wrote that's um, on, on the bottom of the slide there, with, that focuses on all of these external factors that contribute to disproportionality. What's important to keep in mind when we talk about these external factors related to racism in society, it's important to keep in mind that separating Black children from their parents is foundational to the origins of this country. Separating black children from their parents was used going back to the origins of slavery as a means to maintain power and control over black people by a government that was founded on the idea of white supremacy. After slavery was abolished, what we saw is that policies were developed by the government to maintain the supremacy of white people and to maintain the oppression of Black people because that supremacy was now threatened following abolition of slavery. So forced family separation is something that's been used by the United States government for centuries now to maintain the oppression of Black people, and that persists to today. Um, but what we see is the impact of those policies are the reasons why Black families are more likely to live in poverty than white families. Decades of policies have made it so that we now see things like a wealth gap and education gap, differences in employment. Those are the reasons why Black families are more likely to be living in poverty. Going back to the Black codes, which followed abolition of slavery, to Jim Crow laws, to redlining, intentional policies designed to keep Black people in poverty. We know that because of racism, that impacts also the health and stress of Black Americans. We know from other research that the daily experience of racism contributes not only to mental health challenges, but also to wear and tear on the body, to actual physical problems, um, which is a phenomenon called weathering, um, where racism actually contributes to deterioration of physical health. Um, and then we see that play out in terms of geographic context. Uh, 
things like redlining, how the GI Bill was implemented, impacts home ownership. So we see concentrated poverty, um, mass incarceration or mass criminalization um, in communities of color, all specifically designed to maintain the oppression of Black people. So all of when you hear people talk about disproportionate need, poverty, risks, that is all the result of racism in society. But then it's important to look at internal factors within the system. I don't have time today to talk about the entire history of how the child welfare system developed, but it's important to point out just briefly that the child welfare system from its earliest origins, and that's, that's not on the slide here, I'll get to the slide in a minute. From the earliest origins of the system, the system was created to benefit white children and to maintain the poverty of black children, going back to the orphan trains, which many of you probably heard about. The orphan trains were a system that um, were re relocated poor orphaned children from the Northeast to the Midwest to be raised by in, in family care to get them off the streets. And you'll often hear statistics about that the orphan trains resettled over 200,000 children um, living in poverty in the Northeast to the Midwest. What actually happened is that the orphan trains resettled over 200,000 white children from the Northeast to the Midwest. Black children were intentionally excluded from that. Um, and it wasn't until recent years that we saw black children be overrepresented in this system. So racism is foundational to the origins of the child welfare system. And we've seen that over years in the policies of how that system operates. And what we see then going to this evidence of bias um, as I said, when I left the system and was involved in research in the child welfare system, um, this was a time where the state of Texas actually had a legislative mandate to address racial disproportionality and to study disproportionality. And I, so I was fortunate to be involved in that work, which helped to inform my understanding of why disproportionality exists. What we did with this research is we looked at um, to try to determine why disproportionality exists and the extent to which racial, racial bias impacts disproportionality, separate from these other things like poverty. We looked at two different decision points, the substantiation decision, meaning um, confirmations, a caseworker makes a decision of whether or not abuse happened. And then the need for intervention, meaning was the case need to be opened for some kind of services or closed. And then of the cases that needed intervention, was that intervention removal or was that intervention services that could be provided while the child stays in the home? And as I said, we were able to control for things like income, caseworkers assessment of risk, to try to really determine the extent to which just the race of the child impacted the decisions that were being made. What we found is that when controlling for poverty and risk, black children were 15% more likely than white children to be involved in a substantiated case. And when controlling for both poverty and risk, Black children were 20% more likely than white children to be involved in a case that was open for services. And just of the cases that were open for services, black children were 77% more likely than white children to be removed in lieu of receiving in-home services. And the only thing that explained the difference between removal and getting services in the home was the child's race. That's evidence of racial bias impacting decision making. The other thing that we saw is we looked at risk assessment scores, um, the risks that caseworkers assessed families as having. Um, and so these are just the risk scores for removal cases um, in families that were classified as having high income, families that were classified as having low income. At this time, Texas had a risk assessment instrument that was seven categories of risk that were scored on a Likert scale of one to five, meaning five was the highest risk, one was the lowest risk. So you can have a total risk score of 35, meaning the most extreme risk, or a lowest score of seven, meaning low or minimal risk. As you see here, low income families were assessed as having higher risk than high income families, which is to be expected. But what we found here is that in both high income cases and low income cases where children were removed, black children were scored as our black families were scored as having lower risk than white families. So black families in which a removal happened had lower risk than white families, according to caseworkers assessments. But we also saw that black children were 77% more likely to be removed. What that tells us is that there's differences in how caseworkers make decisions about the need for removal, basically their threshold for making a decision that a child needs to be removed. And what this shows is that the threshold is higher for white families, meaning that in order to justify a removal, a white family has to be much worse 
than a black family to justify a removal. So again, more evidence of bias impacting decisions. Now, why is that a problem? Why is disproportionality a problem? Because disproportionate involvement causes disproportionate harm. We know from an entire body of research, not just in child welfare, but in families who are separated because of immigration, um, children who are separated from their parents because of parental incarceration, um, children who are separated from their parents because of divorce or sudden death. All of that body of research shows that the act of forcible separation of children from their parents is a source of significant and lifelong trauma. That trauma associated with parental separation has been shown to result in cognitive delays, increased aggression, poor educational achievement, and adverse physical health outcomes. Um, children who are separated from their parents are more likely to experience hypertension or high blood pressure, difficulty sleeping, obesity, diabetes, a host of health problems. And you know, many of you have, I think in the general public, have largely come to see the harm that family separation causes in recent years when we've seen that happen at the border. The same pain and trauma that you see children experience when they're separated from their parents at the border is the same pain and trauma that children experience when they're separated from their parents by the state through child welfare agents. But beyond just that initial trauma of family separation, we know that children who spend time in foster care are more likely to experience a host of adverse outcomes. And there's a large, large body of research that shows this up, these differences in outcomes. What's important is that there's some studies that actually look at differences between children who experience similar forms of maltreatment, but stay in their home and receive services in their home, and children who are removed and go to foster care. And what we know that children who are removed and placed in foster care later as adults have two to three times higher delinquency rates, higher teen birth rates, lower earnings as adults, twice as likely to have learning disabilities, six times more likely to have behavioral problems, more likely to have substance use disorder, psychotic or bipolar disorders, and have arrest rates that are two or three times higher and more likely to have criminal convictions for violent offenses. So foster care as an intervention causes children harm. Separating children from their parents causes harm. Foster care causes children harm. And now foster care causes harm for all children. Every child who's in foster care experiences trauma, but the risk of experiencing those outcomes is increased for Black children and other children of color because of racism and inequality in America. Black children in America are already at risk of poor outcomes because of the daily experience of racism that they endure. Um, and as adults, Black Black Americans are more likely to experience things like economic hardship, poor health, low educational attainment, teen births, criminal legal system involvement. Then when we have a system that adds on top of that trauma, family separation, the harm that results from foster care, the risk of experiencing those outcomes is increased. So what we actually have is a system, a state sanctioned system that facilitates the conditions that maintain the oppression of black Americans because putting black children in foster care makes it more likely that they're going to go to prison as adults, makes it more likely that they're not going to be employed, makes it more likely that they're going to be homeless. So this child welfare system acts as an agent of oppression for Black families, which is why we've, we've come to the up-end movement to abolish the system. Why up-end? We know, as I said, yeah, decades of research have documented not only that this overrepresentation exists and is a problem, but the harms that result to Black children and families because of disproportionality. We also know that this isn't a new problem. The child welfare system has been reforming or transforming for decades, and they haven't been able to meaningfully make a dent in this problem, meaning that the harm that results to Black children and families persists. So we believe, many of us who are involved in this work believe that it's time to think of something different. It's time to really think about what it means to be anti-racist, what an anti-racist means of taking care of children in our, our, and think of different ways to think about the safety and well-being of children. So when we think about anti-racism, what that means, we know that anti-racism is a practice that opposes institutional and systemic policies that produce and maintain racial inequity. If you read How to Be an Anti-Racist by Dr. Ibram Kendi, um, you see that's a really good frame of anti-racism work because it really focuses on policies. 
Um, and the way he describes anti-racism is that all policies either produce racial inequity or produce racial equity. There's no such thing as a neutral policy. Every policy produces racist outcomes or it doesn't produce racist outcomes. We know that the child welfare system produces racist outcomes. Um, that's just factual in the data. So when we think about why that happens, we have to look at the policies of the system that create those racist outcomes. And those policies are the policies that sanction the forced separation and removal of children from their parents. So to remedy disproportionality, the solution to that is to stop involuntary separations of children from their parents. So why upend? After decades of attempts to try to reform the system, it's clear that reforms just aren't enough. They're not working. Eliminating the racist inequities that exist in the system, eliminating the harm that the system causes to Black children and families and other children of color will only be achieved when we stop doing that. The reason why reforms haven't worked is because reforms have just kind of tinkered with the practices of the system. Reforms have never attempted to address this foundational intervention of forced family separation. The way to stop these racist inequities from happening is to stop the forcible separations of children from their parents. And we can do that. Um, what Upend is about is about not just ending involuntary separation, but it's about simultaneously increasing supports to families and communities so that families and communities can care for their children. What we wanna do through this movement is rethink state sanctioned separation of children from their parents as a response to social problems. Things like food insecurity, poverty, lack of affordable and safe housing, lack of meaningful prevention services. You know, there is this myth among many people in the general public that the child welfare system is intervening in serious cases of maltreatment. Um, but we know that that's actually not the case. More than 60% of children who are in foster care are in foster care because of neglect. Neglect is largely related to poverty. Less than 20% of children in foster care are in care because of actual physical or sexual abuse. So it's a system that's responding to societal failures by harming children and families. Um, it's important to be clear, by abolition, we really mean the elimination, the complete dismantling of the current child welfare system, which is built on this model of surveillance and separation, and a fundamental reimagining of the ways in which we in society support children, families, and communities. Um, so, but it's important to point out, abolition doesn't mean abandoning the need to care for children. It means dismantling the harmful aspects of the system while we provide new ways of supporting children and families. Um, abolition is a process. It requires that we actively dismantle the racist policies that contribute to the racist outcomes that we see while simultaneously providing families with the resources that they need so children can safely stay in their homes. Reimagining is a process of co-creation with communities, meaning that the goal of this is that families and communities have what they need so that children can stay in their homes, live healthy, eat, have housing, have parents have sustainable jobs with sustainable wages, mental health services, food, domestic violence supports, everything that families need to thrive. And when we reimagine this, what that will look like is families have what they need. Families have concrete supports to have their basic needs met. Residents of communities intervene when needed. Community members provide support to others. Our vision is that when a family is in crisis, families and communities are first responders rather than the state. And then there's a sufficient array of supports within the community so that there's a community system of care that minimizes and addresses harm. So I think it's important to point out, I love this quote by Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, who is a longtime prison abolitionist. What many people misunderstand about the abolition movement is there's this perception that we just want to end foster care, stop removing kids, and then children will just be rampantly abused and harmed. That's not what any abolition movement is about. That's not what the police abolition movement is about. That's not what the child welfare abolition movement is about. What Ruth Wilson Gilmore says is that abolition is about presence, not absence. It's not just about the absence of foster homes. Abolition is about the presence of all of the supports that families need to be able to raise their children, 
um, and in a healthy way where children are maintained safely in their homes. Um, what Ruth Wilson Gilmore says is that abolition is a way of seeing. Abolition makes you ask, when you look, what are you seeing and what would you rather see? What we see now when we look at the child welfare system is a system that disproportionately surveils black and brown bodies. We see a system that disproportionately separates black and brown children from their parents. And we see a system that responds to societal failings by causing harm to children and families. What I would rather see is that parents and families have what they need. If when you really think about this is more than, as I said, more than 60% of children are in, who are in foster care are in foster care because of neglect. Neglect is related to largely to poverty. So we have a system that removes children from their parents, forcibly separates them from their parents because of largely poverty related concerns. And then we place those children in foster homes with strangers. And then we pay those strangers money to raise someone else's children. In Texas, foster care payments are an average of about $900 a month. So we pay strangers $900 a month to raise someone else's children. What if we just gave that $900 a month to the parent who's struggling to meet their children's needs? We wouldn't need foster care. So this abolition movement isn't about ending foster care. It's about making the need for foster care obsolete. And we know that we can do that. We know that just a moderate amount of direct financial assistance to families significantly reduces maltreatment, significantly reduces contact with child welfare systems. This is about how we as a society make decisions to allocate our resources. And if we choose to allocate our resources to families and communities, divest them from the billions of dollars that go into maintaining foster homes and were to redirect that money to families and communities, we wouldn't need foster care. That's what this movement is about. Um, so lastly, um, looking forward to your questions. If you want to learn more about Upend, um, you could follow us on Twitter at Upend Movement. Um, my handle is Alan Detloff on Twitter. I talk about these issues a lot. Um, so please also go to our website. It's upendmovement.org to learn more about um, the movement for abolition. We're planning a series of events over the rest of the year to talk about really concrete ways about how we could get to abolition. Um, so I hope you'll all stay tuned for that. So thanks very much. I'll go ahead and stop sharing and I'm looking forward to hearing what you all think. Great. Thank you so much, Dean Detlef. That was uh, a great um, overview with tons of information. So I really appreciate you providing a foundation uh, for this conversation. Um, both about some of the historical pieces and context, as well as the up end movement itself. Um, and I, I really appreciate how you framed um, the terms abolitionist movement, um, because I do think there's oftentimes a lot of it misunderstanding uh, when you use that term. Um, and so I, I think what you said, and I, I also am, I think uh, Liz said this in the introduction, I have uh, all of my professional career, whether it's practice or teaching, um, research have been, has really been directly involved with the child welfare system. And so, um, so I, I, I know that there's been decades and decades of reform efforts um, that have really aimed specifically at addressing racial disp disp disparities and disproportionality. And yet we see that those disparities persist. And so I really appreciate this idea of completely reimagining, kind of having a systemless system to better address the issue. Um, and I wonder though, if you, I, I think, and you already spoke to this, I, again, I think some people get nervous when they hear the word abolition. So I'll start us off with a question, then we can open it up to others if you wanna post a question in the chat, um, but I'll start us off. Uh, you said this a little bit already, but um, I was also listening to um, our esteemed uh, scholar Dorothy Roberts, who described um, described abolitionist movements also as um, needing to take an incremental dismantling approach. Um, so I want, just wonder if you could speak to kind of how you see that. Um, how do we reimagine and at the same time keep kids safe right now? How do we? How do you see that transition to make sure that we ensure? families can stay together safely. 
Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And, you know, I, I should mention, um, you know, Dorothy Roberts um, talked about abolition 20 years ago in her book, Shattered Bonds. Um, when I read Shattered Bonds, I mean, that was a big part of what changed the direction of my career to look at the harms that the system causes to Black children and families and ultimately now to work toward abolition. But Dorothy Roberts is ab absolutely one of the founders of this movement. Um, and and it, it is an incremental approach. Um, you know, I, I, I always talk about that. You know, right now there is a need for some intervention. Um, by child welfare systems in, in a small amount of cases. You know, I think what this work is about is trying to um, dismantle in part the myth of this system as being helpful. Um, you know, a lot of people think, and that myth comes largely from media depictions of the child welfare system, where there are, there are some very serious cases of abuse where children are, you know, tortured, locked in cages, starved. Um, that happens very infrequently, but it does happen. When that happens, that's deemed newsworthy. It's on the news. The news talks about Child Protective Services responding to those cases. And that creates the perception for people who don't really know about the system that that's largely what child welfare is intervening is, when in fact it's not. As I said, less than 20% of children who are in care are in care because of physical or sexual abuse. So it, this movement is incremental in the way that there are ways that we can significantly decrease the use of removal right now um, on the cases that are largely poverty related, children who don't need to be in foster care, children who can be served in other ways through other systems. And if we could gradually start to reduce the use of removal and then redirect all of the money that goes into um, child welfare services into funding foster care and redirect those funds to families and communities. We could eventually get to the place in society where one, there's less poverty, um, but two, there's also maltreatment because there is this really strong correlation between poverty and maltreatment. So if we could start to divest from the child welfare system and invest in families and communities, we could gradually get to a place where the child welfare system is not necessary. Great. I, I see there's a couple of questions related to this. I was going to ask about, um, and again, I think you hinted at this in your talk a little bit, but you know that we, the upend movement is, um, I think, part of a larger multifaceted movement now to think about dismantling white supremacy in multiple systems, whether it's defunding the police, abolishing the police, you know, use other kind of abolitionist movements. How do you see um, this, the upend movement related to or intersecting with those other systems as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, all, of the, all of these abolitionist movements are very similar in that it looks at the harms that carceral systems cause to people, um, whether those, and it looks at society's response of punishment as a means of addressing societal failures, things like, things like poverty, homelessness, joblessness. What we have is we have this array of carceral systems that treat problems by, through punishment and by causing harm to people, whether that is in the form of um, a prison, a detention center, or a foster home. We see a societal response to lock people in cages as a means of resolving problems, whether that cage is a prison or a foster home. They're all related in the sense they're a response to societal failings that punish people instead of choosing to address the underlying problems. When it comes to the police, we know that it isn't, and, and the movement to defund the police, the reason to defund the police is because it isn't the police that keep people safe. Actually, the opposite is true. The police put people in danger. You just, you could turn on your TV right now and hear about how harmful the police are. Police don't keep people safe. What keeps people safe is well-funded public schools, access to healthcare, access to mental health services, access to food, jobs with living wages. All of those things create public safety. We don't need uniformed people with guns to create that. We need funding to go to families and communities. So all of these abolitionist movements are about looking at the ways government systems that were designed out of a system of white supremacy, both the system of policing, the system of child, child welfare, were designed by white people 
hundreds of years ago to maintain the power and privilege of white people. When you see the disparities that exist in policing and the harm that policing causes to black Americans, that's not evidence of a problem. It's evidence that the system of policing is working exactly how it was created. When we see black children harmed by the child welfare system and the disparities that exist there, again, it's not evidence of a problem. It's evidence that the system is doing what it intended to do by keeping white people in power and maintaining the oppression of black people. So all of these movements to try to end these carceral systems are for the purpose of creating what is actual safety, what's actual well-being in communities. And the billions of dollars that go to these carceral systems, if they were, if those funds were given to families and communities, we could really get to a place where they're not necessary. I see that one question, there's a couple of questions more specifically around upend, um, but I also just want to say one question was, what do you envision being the ignition or catalyst that starts this change? And I, I would say that it has already started. Um, you know, I think upend is evidence that it's, it's started. Um, but I think there's some questions just about kind of who are some of the kind of the players, the stakeholders, who's involved in upend um, at the national kind of state and local levels? What, if you wanna just say a little bit more about the movement itself. Yeah, absolutely. So first, I mean, the up, upend as a movement is, is relatively new. Um, we, this movement launched um, last year, um, but it's building on other abolitionist movements that were in child welfare that I think have come more to the forefront now. Um, movement for Family Power is, a, is, is an example of an organization that's been calling for abolition of the child welfare system for, for many years. Um, people like Dorothy Roberts are very active in this movement. And there are a lot of, a lot of other parent groups, um, groups of former youth who were formerly in foster care that are all involved in the movement to abolish the system. I think what Upend added to those movements is it brought it into an academic space like this and to a social work space, um, you know, partly because of my position in the School of Social Work. But being in those spaces is really important because, um, you know, social work for the, is largely synonymous with child welfare systems. Um, you know, that we know that the actual workforce of child welfare systems is not largely social workers, um, but social workers are very involved in this system. And it's important for social workers to be talking about this, um, just as it's important for social workers to be talking about how we collaborate with the police. Uh, you know, my view is that social workers have to get to the place where we realize one collaborations with the police are harmful and we need to completely remove ourselves from that profession. Um, that's a whole other debate that's happening in the field. Um, but then too, understanding that social workers need to understand the harm that the profession causes to families and specifically black families through the child welfare system. And I think it's really, it's problematic in the sense that the National, the National Association of Social Workers, our professional organization, their policy statement is that all child welfare caseworkers, 100% of child welfare caseworkers should minimally have an undergraduate degree in social work, meaning NASW wants the entire workforce of child welfare systems to be social workers. I think social workers need to divest ourselves from the system because we can't continue as a profession to be involved in systems that cause people harm, like prisons, policing, and child welfare. Great. For that, uh, on that provocative note, um, as we uh, divest from all of those systems, I, I, um, there's a couple of questions in here too about, and I think this is not unique to child welfare, but um, kind of the role in kind of social control of normative, kind of disciplining a, a normative white. A supremacist concept of what a family is. Um, and so I wonder, I also want to tie that to another question around just around intersectionality as well. So thinking about how to center equity around race, at the same time, recognizing that there's other identities that are disproportionately impacted by the child welfare system, certainly uh, gender, LGBTQ um, communities, youth, um, as well as socioeconomic status. You, or you already mentioned that there's a, a real intersection between poverty and race. Um, so just wondering, kind of thinking about um, how, do, how do we still center the discussion around race, but recognizing that it's, um, that there's multiple 
uh, concepts and, and issues to address at the same time as we reimagine the system? Yeah, that's a great question and, and an important one. And I think, you know, abolition work needs to be centered around the harms that the system causes to Black children and families because they've been the most impacted by the system. But when we work towards abolition of the child welfare system with Black children and families at the center, we're also working towards eliminating the oppression that the system causes to all children and families, to Native families, to Latinx children and families, to LGBTQ youth, that the system also disproportionately harms. Abolishing the child welfare system helps all children and families, but it needs to be led with the voices and experiences of Black children and families at the center because they've been most impacted by it. But it will ultimately end the oppression of all children and families that are impacted by the system. And I think going back to that first part of that question, I think that it's a really important point that again, social work has a lot of work to still untangle. Everything that we believe in society about what maltreatment is, what good parenting is, um, is all based on a white middle-class normative parenting standard. That white middle-class normative parenting standard then was used to develop all of the policies that govern child welfare systems. Even like mandatory definitions, mandatory minimum definitions of maltreatment, which are defined in CAPTA, the Child Abuse Prevention Treatment Act back to the 1970s, was all led by white people. And all of the definitions of maltreatment are based on this white normative parenting lens. And we see that impact then how people make decisions in child welfare agencies. Um, people use this lens that's built into the policies to make decisions about children and families. But everything that we know, that's how, and, and you know, that, that's how institutional racism works. It's all of the policies of the system were developed by white people using this white normative middle-class parenting view, view of parenting, um, view of a good family. And all of that is baked into the policies of this system. So everything that society thinks about maltreatment is based on this white normative lens. And that's why we see, partly why we see the disproportionate outcomes in the system. We just had a question about, um, and I'm not sure uh, exactly. It, the question is, what actions can we inspire individuals to support this movement or to get involved? Um, and so I, I, you could take that a couple of ways. What can we do personally maybe to inspire others to join? Um, and kind of what actions can we take moving forward? Yeah, I would say, you know, first, I mean, you could you could learn more about our the, the movement at our website, upinmovement.org. But, you know, I think it's more than that. I think that's social workers should start identifying themselves as abolitionists and really learn about what that means. You know, um, year, year and a half ago, abolition of carceral systems was kind of like a fringe idea that social work didn't really talk about. It's very much in the mainstream now. And we need more people talking about that. Um, more social workers talking about the need to abolish carceral systems and the need for social workers to get out of working in carceral systems. Um, so that's a big part of it, just everyone watching to start to speak out about that and be vocal about it. Because you may see, this is not something that social workers have entirely coalesced around. Um, you know, social workers tend to agree on a lot of issues. Um, issues related to social work and policing, um, issues related to social work and forced family separations, that's not something that social workers agree on. There are many social workers who um, are very much against the movement to defund the police, are very much against this, uh, this specific abolitionist movement. So we need more people actively talking about the need for abolition and the harm that the systems cause and the harm that the social work profession causes. Because in a lot of ways, bringing it specific to child welfare, a lot of this is about awareness building. Um, the difference between the defund the police movement or abolition of police and prisons and de um, abolishing child welfare is that most people in the general public now understand how harmful policing is. Again, you, you just have to turn on the TV to do that. Child welfare doesn't have comparable things to that. You can't turn on the TV and see the harms that the child welfare system is causing to Black children, like you can see the harms that policing causes to Black Americans. Um, so a lot of this movement is about trying to change this or dismantle this myth of the system being helpful. One, by pointing out that 
the large majority of children who are in foster care are in foster care because of poverty. Um, two, by really talking specifically about how harmful the system is. We can't continue as a society to forcibly separate children from their parents and subject them to an intervention that we know causes harm. I mean, it's just insane that we just continue to do that. And social work is complicit in that. So social work has to start to stand up and say, no, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to walk arm in arm into Black communities with the very people who are terrorizing them, meaning the police. Um, we're not going to continue to work in the system that forcibly separates children from their parents as a means of trying to save them. We just can't continue to do that as a profession. So the more of us who speak out about that, the more we're gonna eventually see the tide turn. And what we ultimately need is then for more, as we change that perception in the public, there will be more political will to change the system through policy solutions. And that's what we ultimately need. Well, I can think of no better uh, note to end on than that really outstanding call to action. So again, thanks, uh, Dean Dudloff, and I'll turn it back over to uh, Shanta. Well, we are at the end. This was wonderful. Thank you, Dean Dudloff, again, for sharing your time and your wisdom and your research with us. Thank you, Dr. Simanjin Jones, for her, um, conducting this wonderful discussion. And thank you, everyone else, for joining us and asking the crucial questions. And till next time and next month, yeah, be safe, be well, goodbye. Thank you all.